Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? Kendall here with the Wealthy Legacy Journey, <clears throat> bringing you guys another book report. This one being the little book that still beats the market by Joel Greenblatt. And uh, this is an awesome read. I read this book in probably like three or four hours. It was a pretty short read. I'm not a very fast reader. So maybe some of you hear that and you're like, oh, wow, it took you forever. But um, I'm not a super fast reader. Um, but I guess I'm okay fast. Maybe I'm get a little bit faster since we've done a couple book reports. Um, little uh, tidbit about me. I didn't read my books in uh, junior high or high school. I just did cliff notes. And so this is a new practice for me. So I'm, I'm learning how to be disciplined reading. Anyways, let's get to the book report. This book report, um, or this book was so good. Uh, man, did I enjoy this. If, if you are thinking about your investing journey, have anything to do with the stock market, I would highly recommend you read this book. Um, even if it's just to understand why he does what he does. So basically in this book, Joel, um, I don't know if I should call him Mr. Greenblatt or Joel, uh, or maybe I'll just say Joel Greenblatt. Um, he introduces us to his magic formula and, um, he goes, obviously he talks about how he goes a little bit more in depth into it in the end of the book, in the appendix, he talks about all the math. But if you're not a math whiz, I love the math. So I went all through the math and I figured out some of it. And then I was like, okay, I need to let my brain rest. And I need to go do that again because it was super cool. Um, and I want to get my head wrapped around it. But um, if you're not a math whiz, it's totally okay because most of the book isn't around math. He just explains this is what you do. And he built out a very simple, very formulaic, very logical based system. And um, I'm not going to tell you guys what the formula is because that is for you guys to discover. I'm also not going to tell you what the website is where he gives you the exact um, best stocks to pick because uh, that, again, is for you to discover. Um, but he gives you some really cool tools and resources in here. So before I get too far, I just want to remind you guys that at the top of the video, there's going to be um, in the description, or at the top of the description of the video, excuse me, um, there's going to be a link to the Google Doc with the resources page. And I will have a link to Amazon of where you can purchase this book. And um, it is an affiliate link, so it does help the channel if you buy the book. And I really appreciate it if you use that link. Um, but neither here nor there. It doesn't cost you any extra to use the link. I just go find the, the best price Amazon link that I can and I drop it on there. Um, but I would highly recommend you get this book. Um, basically, Joel Greenblatt talks about how to find a business who is really good at turning their invested capital into increased gains, uh, meaning that they have a high return on investment in their internal capital usage. Um, the purpose of that being mean that if they can, you know, create a new warehouse, create a new plant, um, they can exponentially increase uh, the output of their business. Another benefit of that as well is that they can use money from the marketplace um, to be able to, you know, such as like debt and bonds and things of this nature um, to fund uh, business endeavors much easier than a company who had really small margins um, because, you know, just the interest on the money and stuff will, will be crushing versus a strong company. Um, but the other piece of that pie is he talks about how do you find a company that um, is relatively inexpensive? So find a company that's good at turning some money into more money, but at this current moment, they're relatively inexpensive. There's probably something going on with the company um, that doesn't make them look like a good prospect. Now, that in its general self sounds like, okay, yeah, duh, that would be great to do, but how do I do it? Well, the great part is, and actually, let me see, which chapter is this? Um, chapter, oh, he doesn't label what the chapters are. Oh, no, no, yeah, he does. Okay, so page 137 uh is the step by step instructions so i wouldn't skip by the step to the step by step instructions by any means because he, he gives a lot of lessons through here of why the magic formula works but then he literally breaks it down here on page 137 for us of do this then do this then do this then do this and then bada bing bada boom there you go and um no, not every investment vehicle is so simple. And one of the big takeaways that I took from this book was that this is a long-term strategy. So don't look for overnight riches out of it. Um, you have to stick with the program and, and to really be able to get that competitive edge using this formula 
Um, but I think he was saying over the course of about three years, it over it outperforms on average the S and P 500 once you've been applying it for at least three years um, on average, uh, according to their studies. And uh, so let me jump right into this. Um, well, right here, beginning note, this will take time and patience to produce. Um, but uh, yeah, that he mentioned that over and over and over. He really went through here and talked about how he wanted this to make sense to you. Um, this is really good. Investing is hard. That's why having a disciplined, methodical, long-term investment strategy that makes sense is essential to making it through and being successful in almost any market environment. That's so true. It's not even just stocks. It's stocks, real estate, and business, and all of it. That discipline, methodical, long-term investment strategy. But it can't just make sense. It must make sense to you. Having a deep understanding is the only way to stick with a long-term strategy that might not work over shorter periods of time. And uh, so anyways, I there's lots of good highlights and stuff in here, but I, I'm trying to figure out how to make these book reports a little bit more efficient. And so what I'll probably do is um, just go through here and kind of I had like a goal or recap or something like that at the end of each chapter um, that I wrote in my book, as well as like a bunch of highlights and stuff all over the place. Um, if I if I see one that I feel like is just pops out at me, we'll go to it. Um, but at the end of chapter one, you know, really the thing that I got out of it was the goal is to buy pieces of solid companies at a discount, which makes a whole lot of sense. If you can buy something that you know should be very valuable for some moment, they're for some reason right now they're going through a stormy season. The idea is is that they'll be able to come through that stormy season and then be able to start performing well in business again and their stock uh, value will go back up. Um, yeah, and then this was really good. It takes a great amount of discipline to save any money. After all, no matter how much money you earn or receive from others, it's simply much easier to, uh, excuse me, simply much easier and more immediately rewarding to find something to spend it on. It's so true. It's that it's the case with the wealth legacy journey. It's the case with double dare your money. Like it's easier to spend it on yourself, but the long term gain from investing well is going to go a long way. Um, so save your money for things that count and avoid instant gratification. Is one of the little notes I made here. Um, this was interesting. He gives this like little note here on on fourteen, and I I said this is why government bond pricing matters. We have to make more um, on our investment than the risk-free government bond pays. Um, now, you know, whether it's really risk-free or not, it's a whole nother topic. I'm um, not saying that it is, not saying that it is, and I'm not trying to start a, a whole side tangent on that. Um, but he talked about how basically they measure, you know, the risk-free bonds at 6% if they're at or below 6%. And if they're above 6%, it has to be above that. And so basically he's saying the return on investment for an investor of their money has to be at or above the government bond rate. Um, so how can we get you know our ROI at or above what the government bond is paying? Um, so when buying stocks at a discount, ensure our investment has the potential to beat all the bonds. Um, typically, government bonds are risk free um, and they're the lowest cost. And then you know there's company bonds at the next risk level, and then the next risk level he mentioned is just basically um, pure investment brings me to chapter three um so chapter three is where he kind of starts giving us this large more larger scale you know example of what it means like here you can see this is like a, a statement of uh an income statement the annual income statement that'll come out so like uh 10ks 10qs that come out for um, publicly traded companies and so your net income that's your bottom line um after everything's taken out so he talks about how you have your total sales of 10 million and he's given a rough example your cost of goods sold 6 million gross profit is 4 million and then you have selling general administrative expenses of 2 million income before taxes is 2 million tax at 40 percent is 800,000 so your net income is 1.2 million um and so he talks about specifically this he's like okay well let's say this guy is trying to go for a $12 million valuation. And he's trying to, you know, basically break that up among a, a thousand uh, shares or excuse me, a million shares. Um, so each share costs $12. Uh, um, and if you had $1.2 million in income, so then your earnings per share was $1.20. Um, and he kind of starts breaking down some of this fundamental, you know, basic understanding for us and, and doesn't in a really simple and easy to understand way. And that's one of the things that I think would highlight this whole book 
was that Joel Greenblatt really did a good job of bringing it down to earth, bringing it to um, not so theoretical high level company. The example he's actually giving here is like a gum business. And so um, like G-U-N, chewing gum. Um, I know I have a little bit of a stopped up nose, so I didn't want that to be misunderstood. But, uh, you know, whenever I go through here and I'm reading these different aspects he's talking about, he does it in such a simple and easy to understand way. Like it almost feels like it should be more complicated, but the way he explains it makes it seem much more simple. And I think that's the beauty of this book. And I think that's part of why I loved it so much. Um, it was great. So recap here on, on chapter three, evaluate companies as if you're buying a hundred percent of it based on current values and future expectations on historical growth. Um, and so he talked about how, like, when we when we buy a portion of a company, whether it's one shares, a million shares, or all the shares that the company has available, we need to go into that decision of saying, okay, based on this company's track record, what do I think it can do in the future? Is this a company that I would be willing to buy 100% of it? If, if buying this company were going to cost me, you know, a billion dollars, or in this case with the gun business, $12 million, do I think it would be worth investing $12 million into this business? Do I think I could have a greater return on investment on this business over time than I could in some other investment vehicles if I had to look at what I could do with specifically a full $12 million? Um, and so that's really how you break down that decision. He talks about how to do that in a really easy way. The expected ROI must beat uh, uh, the ROI on a 10-year government bond to be worth the risk. Um, this leads to the chapter four. Um, Okay, so listen to this. A company as large as, he talks about like the volatility of the market. A company as large as IBM or General Motors might have its dividend to its ownership stake uh, into something like a billion equal shares. This means that if at one point during the year you can purchase one share of General Motors for $30, for our example, we assume ownership of General Motors has been divided into 1 billion equal pieces or shares, then the implied price to purchase the entire company, all 1 billion shares, would be $30 billion. However, at some point during the same year, General Motors shares could have been purchased for $60 each. That would indicate that the cost to purchase all of General Motors would be $60 billion. We said, how can this be? Can the value of General Motors, the largest car manufacturer in North America, change that much within the same year? Can a company that can a company that large be worth $30 billion one day and then a few minutes later be worth $60 billion? And his answer is no. So why did the prices of the business move around so much on the stock market? Um, even though the value of the business cannot change that much. And uh, basically broke it down. He said, who knows, who cares? He blames it on this Mr. Market that he calls it. And he, he's pulling the term Mr. Market from another great investor, um, Benjamin Graham. And basically he said, you know, to summarize my own way of thinking, Mr. Market has short-term mood swings. To beat Mr. Market, we have to operate with a long-term logic. Um, so if you're playing short term, you're trying to understand the mood swings of Mr. Market and make quick gains. And that's like more like day trading, intraday trading. But this long term focus of building wealth, um, which Joel Greenblatt really talks about in this book is what this book is really mainly about. is talking about how do I look at the long term logic? Because eventually Mr. Market will make the right decision, but he might be an emotional roller coaster before getting there. Um, maybe, you know, other people, you maybe know people like that. Um who knows? This is about the stock market. This is about specifically uh, Mr. Market. One thing he talks about is um, a principle from Benjamin Graham um, and really also making sure that you have a margin of safety, which is important in any investment vehicle, whether it be real estate or stocks, is that we say, OK, here's what I think I can sell it for. Um, this would be a good price. And then this is a good price with a margin of safety in case I'm wrong on anything. It gives me a little bit of a buffer. It's always important to have a buffer, even in real estate, as I acquire properties, we always want to have a buffer because you never know when something goes sideways. You never know when something goes a way that you wouldn't have expected it to go. You have to have a margin of safety built in. So our recap is my job is to value companies with long-term perspective. I need to ask myself if I would be willing to own that company for 10 plus years through all economic waves. If yes, at what price would I be willing to buy it? And then I need to add a margin of safety in case I'm a bit overpriced. From there, uh, where is Mr. Market price in relation to my price? So I've come up with this. If I'm saying, yes, I'm willing to buy it. And yet here's the price that I would be willing to buy it at. And okay, now let me increase it at a margin of safety. And then I have my final price. And it's like, okay, that's where I'd be willing to buy this company. 
And then I just look at where's Mr. Market pricing us today. And if he's above me, then I wait. If Mr. Market is below me, then I buy. And if Mr. Market is right where I'm at, well, then maybe I need to wait for Mr. Market um, to have to swing one way or another. Um, unless I'm at the place where I'm already accounting for that margin of safety. And if I'm going, okay, margin of safety is there. And um, here's what I buy it at. Here's my margin of safety. And, you know, price is right there. Then I can go ahead and take it. Um, and obviously, the more mar Mr. Market is below me, the better off I am. That leads us into chapter five. It really starts talking about some more technicals um and don't let don't let the idea of like technical scare you away because again joel greenblatt does a great job of keeping this very very simple um but he breaks down in just simple ways he talks about earning yields and return on capital um and how to break some of these figures down and the importance of each one of them on um your your investment but simply put the way i broke it down is return on capital is how much money in versus how much money out um or really it's more of okay if i put in this much money how much money will i receive as a return what's our roi which we talked about a lot in the wealth of legs journal return on investment your earnings yield is um basically your earnings per share divided by market cap which he explains the math a little bit better in the in the which so it's not quite this he explains it a little bit better in the appendix um, but essentially, it's EPS over market cap, and your EPS is your bottom line earnings divided by the number of shares. Um, and then to recap, you know, this chapter, my big takeaway was that earnings yields help us to determine my personal ROI, which helps me decide if I want to tie up my capital there. Return on capital helps me determine how healthy a company is. So if they have a high return on capital, they'll be able to expand operations, compete in the market and weather economic downturns much better. So really when I look at that, if I'm, I'm looking return on capital, I wanna make sure that I'm investing in a strong company who has the ability to stay profitable. Earnings yield is that's more for me saying, okay, if I have a strong company, how much money do I think I'm gonna be able to make out of this as an investor, as um, a dividend holder, as a stockholder who receives dividends. Um, and so those are kind of the two main factors that uh, Mr. Joel Greenblatt talked about here. Chapter six, if the market downturns, study potentially study Graham's model to find a safe bottom to re-enter. He talked about Benjamin Graham's model and how it was kind of like the, the big model for a long time. And I've heard Warren Buffett talk about this model many times. And basically it was, can we purchase a company um, at a price that is less than what what it would be worth to to liquidate the entire company, if that makes sense. So if let's say that this company holds, you know, $10 million worth of assets and based on the stock price, you can buy it at $8 million. Well, even if the company were to shut down, have to liquidate all of its assets, you're still going to end up coming out net positive. Um, and so that was Benjamin Graham's formula. Uh, but Joel Greenblatt said, that unfortunately, you can't really find companies in this economy right now that are priced that low. Um, and so basically, you know, his magic formula is looking for it's again, I said relative when we first talk, it's that which one is relatively going to give you the highest earning yield and relatively has the um, highest return on capital. And to have a high earnings yield, you're going to have to have a low cost basis. So out of all the stocks that, it, it, you know, we're going to screen, uh, look for which one has the lowest cost basis and the highest return on capital. Um, and, you know, the stocks that kind of meet up and have the best of both of those worlds, those are the ones that we're really looking at. And the nice part about it is you're looking at those stocks relative to every other stock in the market. Why do that? Well, really, that's because, you know, these companies are in an economic downturn, but eventually when they turn things around, people will see what's going on and they'll be able to catch back up to the rest of the pack. That's kind of the idea here. Um, so, yeah. Basically, you know, we're looking for higher yield with less risk. How can we make higher yield with less risk? Um, he said, it'll be your belief in the overwhelming logic of the magic formula that will make the formula work for you in the long run. And um, basically, you know, we're finding good companies at bargain prices. So a recap of chapter six is to look for companies with a strong ranking on earnings yield and strong ranking on return on capital to see strong growth. It's kind of, right, it kind of makes sense. Okay, we're gonna look for prices that 
don't cost that much, but they're really solid companies. We're looking for them to have a comeback and we're going to ride the wave with them, right? That's That makes a lot of sense when you break it down so simply. And he does a great job explaining not just what to do, but how to do it. Chapter seven um, goes into some interesting topics here. And uh, this is where, you know, he mentions, unfortunately, in today's market, few, if any companies qualify for purchase under Graham's original formula. That means Graham's formula isn't as useful as it once was. Fortunately, our magic formula doesn't seem to have that problem. It's merely a ranking formula. So my recap from chapter seven was really, you know, this formula ranks prospects against each other to find the best opportunities in the market out of all the opportunities available in the market. In my mind, I would assume myself and other value investors would buy low. Um, the buying pressure pushes up prices, which creates good news. Um, the good news, as well as, you know, maybe them rectifying whatever problem the company was having, um, brings more buyers, which pushes the price further up. And this starts creating headlines. Now this company has returned from the ashes, has big headlines, it's doing amazing. Well, that pushes the prices even further up till a bubble starts to form. And then eventually people start to realize that they're overpaying for the thing and the bubble pops and the whole thing starts over. And so our goal is how can we find something that people aren't really looking at, people aren't really valuing right now, get into it, hold it for the long run. And then when the when we that bubble, we start to go like, okay, this bubble's starting to inflate. Maybe it's time to exit the bus. We exit, and then who knows? Maybe we don't get all the way to the top. Maybe the bubble keeps going for a little bit longer, and then but eventually it pops. It goes back down, and we find another opportunity to buy. The great thing I love about this, to be honest with you guys, is like instead of just looking at one particular company or something like that, um, you're constantly able to cycle through and look for new companies because there's always like if you think about you know um, how the companies stack up, there's always going to be a, the best, and there's always going to be the worst. Right, because no matter what, however you stack those, they're, they're not going to be exactly equal, and there's always going to be one on top, and there's always going to be one on the bottom. And so, as those are all changing ranks and stuff, when we're looking for these different opportunities, um, there's always going to be one at the bottom that has the opportunity to rise to the top, as well as one being at the top that we don't really want to <laughs> probably get into. Um, as the bubble pops, prices fall as people run away, which is fear. The price will fall until this becomes the best value on the block and the cycle will continue. So it becomes the best value Then value investors like us, you and I, who are trying to build wealth. We see the opportunity here again, we get back in. Um, and that's why there are still going to be mar um, good bargains in a macro market bubble uh, because bargain pricing is simply a macro market pricing comparison. We're just comparing apples to apples and saying, which apple is the cheapest today? Which apple has a, is a strong value, but is um, for some reason it's underpriced and uh, we're going to buy that one and, and bet that it'll go up because it, it is a strong company, you know, in this case, um, that has the ability to make money and it'll eventually return. Um, you know, going into chapter, oh goodness, what are we on? Chapter eight, I think, yeah, chapter eight. This is where he really started to show some of the data about how, you know, this formula that he's put together is powerful, um, but it doesn't always work out amazing in the short run. It works out over longer periods of time. And that's why he said it's about an average about three years to, to really see it come to fruition. Um, it's not perfect in the short run, but it is, however, consistent in the long run. Now, what I'm really excited about just to kind of, well, I don't really want to get on another tangent. This is about this book. Um, so anyways, he mentioned here, though, that uh, jump, or this is kind of an interpretation that I took out of the book. Jumping from trend to trend or strategy to strategy is as bad as jumping from stock to stock or idea to idea. So just pick your strategy and stick to it. Um, this strategy makes a ton of sense. It's very logical based. And so it's like, can you stick, can you go with this strategy? Can you understand why this strategy should work? And can you stick with it in the long run? Because if you have a bad year, it's gonna be really hard to keep believing in it. But can you understand the logic here? Can you be disciplined enough to stay focused enough to just do it over and over and over again? And it's gonna be the long run where you experience the overwhelming um, success. This is a, my recap of the chapter eight was this is a long-term strategy might not be perfect each year, but over a decade, it will outperform. That rolls us into chapter nine. Um, so chapter nine, owning a business that has the opportunity to invest some or all of its profits at a very high rate of return can contribute to a very high rate of earnings growth. So this must be why I want to, um, this is, and this, this is a note that I made of, you know, being careful about a company that distributes too much of its earnings. Um, because if a company has really high, return on capital, 
Um, but they're giving out, you know, huge amounts in dividends, a, a very large percentage of their, you know, yearly earnings or quarterly earnings in their dividends, but they don't have much money to reinvest into their business. And so that was something I've been told to stay aware of, um, you know, is because like, especially if a company's hurting them, I have to start pulling those dividends. So if you're accounting that dividend payment into your ROI, um, you know, that's just something to factor in for, you know, what you think ROI can be. Um, he talked about the importance of having things like a brand moat. He didn't specifically call it a brand moat. That's what uh, Warren Buffett calls it. Um, another note that I made is therefore uh, being companies that for some reason have some sort of strategic advantage. Okay, so this is what he said. So by eliminating companies that earn ordinary or poor returns on capital, the magic formula starts with a group of companies that have a high return on capital. For some reason, they have some sort of strategic advantage in the marketplace. And that's basically a brand moat. Um, so our recap on this chapter was if a company has a high return on capital, they likely have a brand moat or some sort of strategic market advantage. If they also have a high earnings yield, then they are also, then they are likely priced low and will have um, opportunity for a rebound. Um, rolling into chapter 10 here. Uh, listen to this. Uh, oh, it's not where he gets into it exactly. Um, where does he talk about this? Well, this is good. If an investment strategy truly makes sense, the longer the time horizon you maintain, the better off your chances are for ultimate success. And you might be like, oh, okay, cool. That's good. You're like, yeah, instead of like investing for a day, I'll invest for a few weeks or a few months. This is what he said. Time horizons of five, 10, or even 20 years are ideal. Though not easy to do, even maintaining a three to five year horizon for your stock investments should give you a large advantage over most investors. So short term is equal to speculation. Long term is equal to mark, uh, logic. Over the short term, Mr. Market adds like a wildly emotional guy who can buy or sell stocks at depressed or inflated prices. Over the long run, it's a completely different story. Mr. Market gets it right. Um. So this is interesting. I tell them that though it can occasionally take longer, if their analysis is correct, two or three years is usually the time they'll have to wait for Mr. Market to reward their bargain purchases with a fair price. Um, although over the short term, Mr. Market may set prices based on emotion, over the long term, it is the value of the company that becomes most important to Mr. Market. This means that if you buy shares at what you believe to be a bargain price and you are right, Mr. Market will eventually agree to offer to buy those shares at a fair price. In other words, bargain purchases will be rewarded. Though the process doesn't always work quickly, two to three years is usually enough time for Mr. Market to get things right. So recap on chapter 10, because it might take a few years for Mr. Market to price my company fairly. Um, through buybacks, takeovers, or general reinvesting from the public, maybe some avenues, it will eventually happen. On a side note, I can continue to cut down my cost basis. And this is, this is kind of my own personal side note. Um, with the wealth wheel and the wealth wheel being, you know, the cash flow Academy with Andy Tanner um, and the wealth wheel is really, you know, um, buying or selling covered calls, um, buying puts to enter more positions, buying puts on the beginnings to enter your initial position and um, trying to, you know, take those premiums to continue to lower down your cost basis. So with a five to seven year timeline to a zero cost basis, which is really what they teach in the, uh, in the cash flow Academy, then if I'm looking at a three year time horizon, that should allow me enough time to cut my cost basis roughly in half. Uh, and so then if we see a long-term recovery on that, I've been able to cut my cost basis in half based off of the option premiums that I've collected. I'm doing even better. Um, chapter 11, choosing individual stocks, having any idea what you're looking for is like running through a dynamite factory with a burning match. You may live, but you're still an idiot. <laughs> well, well put blunt straight to the point uh, but it was really interesting i mean it's so true like don't just randomly pick this stuff you know find a formula find something that works in anything that you're going to be doing um find the expert uh and uh really you know work to work to find what works and then practice that put that what works into practice um most people don't know how to evaluate companies for future growth I don't even really know. I'm not really that skilled and competent in how to, you know, value companies for future growth. So I would fall in this category, right, with most of the people. And so he said, that's why if we actually use a magic formula, we'll want to own 20 or 30 stocks at one time. And the magic formula in this case, we want the average. That is the average return for a portfolio of stocks 
chosen by the magic formula. So essentially we're creating our, our own little, you know, index of, of stocks here. And, um, you know, we might have some that are not performing well and, and maybe they'll never uptick again. Um, but we have a couple of winners. And so the idea is like, well, we're already buying at such a discounted price. Most of them might stay flat and then we'll have a couple of them that take off and that'll overall take our portfolio growth up. And it's pretty exponential when he talks about the numbers and the yield that they've seen throughout their studies and over time. Um, you know, but then in my mind, if I'm thinking also back to the wealth wheel, it's like, OK, well, but if and let's say everything holds steady and I've cut my cost basis down over a few years or even if it's one year um i've cut my cost basis down it's like okay so my my likelihood on losing on any of these is pretty low um because of having further continue to lower my cost basis over time um let's see here my recap was choosing individual stocks is very risky if you don't understand how to analyze them properly if you aren't sure how to value stocks then a bit more diversified portfolio would be better so a pro investor, he mentioned, typically is looking at, you know, five to eight stocks um, and they know how to value, you know, those stocks really strongly. And, um, you know, more of like weekend warrior investors are looking to do 20 to 30 stocks at a time. And this is no time to be a hero. I mean, just if you don't know this stuff inside and out, start with 20 to 30. But maybe what you do is just say like, hey, here's the ones that I think will outperform the rest of them. You know, the five to eight that or were to only pick five to eight, I would think I would pick these and then monitor it over time and see was i right and if you start to realize like you're right year after year after year well then you might start shrinking that back putting all your capitals in the in the five to eight um and start experiencing you know even greater um returns this is all about you know a journey that's why this is the wealthy legacy journey I mean, it's just figuring it out and learning and getting better and better and becoming more and more skilled and it's about the journey um one thing to note though is ensure that not all your picks are in the same industry he mentioned to make sure that your stock picks are in different industries um let's see so this takes me to chapter 12 and i think we're pretty much through the. i think there's like 13 chapters if i remember correctly um so recap of chapter 12 12 excuse me chapter 12 is this a long-term strategy and safest way to secure long-term gains um outside of maybe index funds because he kind of breaks down some of the differences and i'll let you see the math uh, of how it would perform but this is pretty interesting um, he talks about by contributing, this is an example on page 128, 129, rolling into chapter 13 here. Um, it's truly a shame by contributing just $28,000 in over six years, in total over six years, uh, maximum of 4,000 per year in both 2006, 2007, and 5,000 per year start from 2008 for four years. Um, so building up, you know, just $28,000 starting with, um, at 15% a year ROI. You're looking at $325,000 at the end of 20 years, 1.3 million after 30 years. You know, the compounding interest here is incredible. Um, if you're at a 20% yield annually average, you're looking at $752,000 after 20 years and 4.3 million after 30. And at 25%, you're looking at 1.6 million after 20 years and 13.4 million after 30 years. And, um, you know, he shows how the returns that they're expecting, even on a 20 to 30, you know, um, stock, you know, kind of index that you put together, uh, you know, could yield around the 30% mark. Um, whenever you go here through here and, and you're looking at all the numbers, it's previous in the chapters, I must have missed it as we were going through, but, you know, go through, read it, um, and see the study analysis that they did at different market cap levels. Um, cause they actually showed you can do this like 50 million, 200 million. And I think the top tier was like a hundred or 1 billion, um, dollar companies. And so there's just different cap levels. Um, and so basically the larger the company, the more, the easier it is to invest large amounts of capital, um, but your ROI annually is typically a little bit lower. And so the whole thing kind of starts to slow down as you go, but you have so much wealth at that point that, you know, the compounding effect is massive. You know, for example, um, Warren Buffett might invest a uh, billion dollars and experience 15% ROI. Well, um, you know, the guy's still making in that case, like $150 million if he has a billion, you know, dollars, cause that's 15% of a billion. So I'm um, $150 million and so bad, I guess, uh, <laughs> you might not get quite 30% ROI, but you know, even if we were to get 10% ROI, make a hundred, a hundred million dollars for the year, not bad. Um, so yeah, instead, so he said, if you understood how well invested quarter could possibly turn into more than $200 by the time you hit middle age. 
um, you might not squander so much money on a single stick of gum. You might not spend money on a lot of things. Instead, you might start to think about saving money wherever possible and spending time figuring out a good way to invest it. Um, and so recap is compound interest is so powerful and trading stocks contributes really honestly little, not a ton of value back to society, um, but you know, maybe some, but the ways I can give back as I have, you know, investments um, is huge. And so from there, then he jumps into the step-by-step -step, um, instructions. Honestly, this is so good. I have highlights all through here, notes all through here. Um, let's see, there's one, then the most basic step is well, option one is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight steps. Um, and step number eight is feel free to write back and thank me. <laughs> um, Cause this is going to be, you know, successful. And um, which, you know, it's, uh, I hope it is. Um, I'm not going to go into what these exact steps are because I feel like the, the real treasure awaiting you inside of this book i would be doing you a disservice if i told you the how and you missed out on the why and the what um so my hope is is that maybe this book report will give you just a little bit of a taste a little bit of a teaser to this book and you'll go out and get this book yourself because in the end he definitely he literally it's step-by-step -step instructions and it's just simple as follow the system and then he has this afterwards the uh 2010 edition um, where he talks about, you know, some of the things that they've learned since the first edition came out, um, particularly that, you know, it works. And then he has his appendix and I actually uh, marked the appendix because there's all of this. This is where he starts going into the math for anybody who wants to know the math. And I, I have just tons of notes in here. And uh, but the main note that I made for myself, as I said, I need to read this until I can explain it um, to a six year old. And uh, so I need to understand it pretty well. Um, but all in all, Guys, that that is the book report um, for the little book that still beats the stock market. Uh, that is probably like not even 50 percent, not even maybe like 10 percent of the treasure, the golden nuggets that are inside of this book. If you're serious about investing, um, especially if you're thinking about putting anything into the stock market, please read this book. Um, even if you don't 100 percent use the strategy, it's going to give you some really valuable insight to what people are looking at, why they're looking at different things in different ways. He breaks down some important fundamentals um, and just it really just the what, um, what it is that they do, how they do it, uh, and also really important, the why they do it. So you can understand why you might think about investing in this way. Um, so with that said, guys. Make sure that you check out, uh, make sure you go to the Google Docs at the, it's in the top of the description of the video and the podcast. Um, you can get the Amazon link to this book. Um, and so that, that way you can uh, go out there and, and purchase it and uh, you will help out the channel too. And I really appreciate that. Um, but the little book that still beats the stock market, I think it's going to change a lot of things for anybody who's investing in the stock market. Um, and uh, I plan to do this as well. Um, in my own portfolio. And so I can keep you guys up to date as much as I remember with as much time as I have in the Wealth Legacy journey. We seem to run out of time every week. Um, but with how applying this strategy to my own portfolio works out um, in the long run. Uh, so with that said, it was awesome hanging out with you guys for another book report. That again is the little book that beats uh, the stock market by Joel Greenblatt. Um, go to the link in uh, the resources doc. Um, or I might even just also include the link in the description of the video that you can go pick up this book. And I hope that you enjoy it. Let me know in the comments what you think about the book um, as you read it, what kind of mental changes it gave you, uh, what you learned as you went through that. And um, I really hope to hear some long-term success stories from other wealthy legacy journeyers with me in the community that read this book, put it to work. Uh, and experience awesome results. With that said, guys, it's been another episode dedicated to you and your own wealthy legacy journey. I hope this helps you guys. I hope you get this book. I hope that uh, you're able to invest well and, and experience the fruits of, of uh, some good hard labor. Um, appreciate it, guys. I will see y'all on the next episode. Bye, y'all.